بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بالسنة إلى يوم الدين. أقول لكم يوم الإسلام يكريتين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Today we are fortunate enough to have Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick with us. He's come from South Africa and spent time to lecture here. Uh, he'll have two lectures, one of them being today and there tomorrow at 9.30. Abdullah Hakim Quick uh, has the distinction of being one of the first American to go to the Islamic University of Medina. He did his bachelor's from there and then he continued on with his master's and PhD from the University of Toronto in uh, Canada. He uh, did it in African history, so he's basically more of an Islamic historian also. Um, he's traveled wide and far to over 50 countries lecturing. Um, now, without further delay, uh, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, Brother Abdullah Hakim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa liya salihin. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين اللهم صل وسلم على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعليه وصحبه أجمعين وبعد All praises are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds and surely Allah is the friend and protector of the righteous and I bear witness that Allah is one and has no partners and that Muhammad the son of Abdullah is his servant and his last messenger and may Allah always and constantly send peace and blessings to Muhammad to his family and his companions, and all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, my beloved brothers and sisters, our guests, our friends, I begin with the greeting words of the righteous, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And these are the words of peace, and to our non-Muslim uh, friends and visitors who are here t tonight, I pray that uh, this would be a source of peace and also a source of understanding. And I want to also uh, bring to you uh, greetings from the Southern uh, Hemisphere, from the Southern part of Africa, uh, from the people who are living in that region. This is an area where there is great opportunity, there is great hope, because people of different religions and different nationalities and different colors are speaking to each other. They are dialoguing uh, with each other and so there is great opportunity for the society to overcome uh, violence and hatred in building a new world. But at the same time, it is also a place where there is great uh, despair. It is the epicenter of the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic. Also, there is uh, a great imbalance between the rich and the poor. And so the people who are entering into Islam and are now understanding the message of Islam are looking to the Muslim world, looking at the sources of Islam for guidance. And I want to uh, seek refuge in the words of Allah Azza wa Jal uh, in Surah Al-Talaq. And especially in the times that we are living in today, um, when the Muslim world finds itself uh, in great crisis and there is great pressure applied to us. What Allah tells us, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَالِغُ أَمْرِ قَدْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدْرًا Allah tells us, and whoever keeps his duty to Allah, has the consciousness of Allah, then Allah will make a way out for him and provide for him from where he knows not. And whoever depends upon Allah, then Allah is sufficient for him. Surely Allah will reach his purpose. And he has made a limit for everything. So there is a limit to oppression. There is a limit to exploitation. And we have to continue to pray that Allah would bless this world, even though we are going through very dangerous changes now but that Allah would bless us to come out of this uh, century of strife, uh, that the world could return to a state of peace. Recently, um, I was asked to go uh, to a set of islands off the coast of East Africa. These are known as the Seychelles chains. There in the Seychelles, 
a group of Muslims were having an exhibition. And they wanted to display to the people of the Seychelles um, what Islam really was, to open up doors that had been hidden to the population for many years. And while uh, we were there on this island chain, we came across a very strange place. And this is called Ladik. It's the island of Ladik. And what is strange about it is that the makeup of this island the rock formations are very strange ones and combined with um, the vegetation gives you the feeling that you have actually gone back uh, in time. And the Seychelles chain are the only islands in the world that are made from granite. Most islands are made either from coral or from volcanoes. These are granite islands. And according to um, scientists, uh, many years ago, over 200 million years ago, approximately, the continents that we know as Africa and Asia, the Middle East, Australia, Antarctica, South America were all combined together. It was one land mass. And with a major change in the earth, um, it split up this Gondwana continent split up into the continents that we know. But somehow the Seychelles was in the middle and it didn't go to, to either of the continents. It stayed by itself in the middle with granite formations. And so it's a unique uh, place. And when you are there, you feel as though you are going back in time. You feel as though you are 100,000 years uh, back in time. And it reminded me uh, of a, a very important project that took place in South Africa where a group of scientists came together and studied the ge geology, uh, archaeology, history of the planet. And they came to the conclusion that we are living in the sixth extinction. That over the past 500 million years, there have been a number of major planetary changes on Earth, and that every hundred million years or so, the, dip, the dominant species on the planet disappeared, became extinct. Whether it was asteroid com, uh, impact or temperature change, carbon dioxide increase, whatever the reason was, for some reason, for some uh, uh, reason only known, known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the dominant species disappeared. But this extinction, which is the sixth major extinction, this is a different one. Because the major factor behind the extinction of mammal life and bird life are human beings. In the past, it was uh, events, big events that happened on the earth. But this time, it is because of human beings. And what is happening around us is that because of what we as a human race have done, we are literally destroying the natural world that has been set out as a place of uh, uh, relaxation for the existence of our race. According to the historians uh, in this project, they looked at human life over the past 100,000 years. And they looked at the waves of humans going out, first out of Africa, into Europe and Asia. And then in the second major wave, from out of Asia into the Americas and into the Pacific region. But the third wave, which is the best studied wave, this, according to historians and scientists, took place after what is known as the European Renaissance. This is somewhere around the 15th century. And human beings came out of Europe and then spread around the planet, colonizing territories, exploiting the land, burning crops, ravaging the surface of the earth, planting cash crops, 
also decimating the aboriginal populations until it reached the point where we see the planet today. And now that things are happening on the planet, people are starting to wake up and to look around and try to understand what is really happening. Because the earth is no longer uh, uh, being a place of nourishment, it is actually becoming uh, a punishment to us. And it is now estimated that somewhere around uh, 70 to 90 percent of the tropical rainforests on earth have been destroyed. It is also estimated that of the earth species, different species, half of the species on earth uh, are gone. This is the sixth extinction, and especially mammals and bird life. Over half of, of the known species have disappeared without any uh, ability to come back. And so with this type of uh, uh, destruction going on, and with a massive amount of carbon dioxide that is being released into the atmosphere, we have entered into what is known as a greenhouse uh, effect, a greenhouse period, where the ozone layer surrounding the Earth, which was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in order to protect us, actually is allowing the ultraviolet rays of the sun to penetrate. And so it is like a greenhouse. We're stuck inside, and, and the, the, the heat is not. Heat is being stuck, and we are literally seeing massive changes in the environment happening around us. And so the recent floods, temperature changes, hurricanes, earthquakes, the language being spoken now is the extremes. It is said that the recent floods in Bangladesh and in India that took place, they say it is the largest floods in living memory. That's the terminology being used. The uh, temperature rise in the, in the 2000s, the 21st century, it is the hottest years unwritten record since people have been recording information. These are the hottest times that has ever existed. And so what is happening is that we are reaching extremes. And because of this heat, the, 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 the polar ice caps are melting in the north and in the south. And recently now you may have uh, seen the news coming out that far in the north, and where I am coming from Canada, from that region there, far in the north, um, there are islands which are appearing in, in the ocean, landmass that is appearing that nobody ever knew about before. It was covered with ice. And now it is appearing. And they're fighting over it. Is it Russia or is it Canada? They're fighting over it as to who actually owns it, when we know it is owned by the creator of the heavens and the earth. But what is important is the level that this is reaching now today, extreme levels. And it is this interesting to note that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in the last book, revealed a message that was not only relevant in the time of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, but will be relevant until the day of resurrection. And so the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who saw himself not as the first prophet of Islam, but he saw Islam and his role as the seal, as the last of a series of prophets and messengers that included Ibrahim, Abraham, alayhi salam, Moses, Jesus, all of the great prophets of monotheism. May Allah be pleased with them and send peace uh, to them. That the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his message is the khatam, or the seal, of these messengers. And in an interesting uh, verse 41 in Surah al rum the chapter of Rome, it says to us, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ دَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحَى بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِ النَّاسِ لِيُذِيقَهُمْ بَعْضَ الَّذِي عَمِلُوا لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ Corruption has appeared on the land and the sea because of what people's hands have earned. 
and we will make them taste something of what they have done in order that they would return to the path. So this verse is saying, corruption has appeared on the land and the sea. Dahar al-fasad, mischief. And the great scholars of Islam, in looking at this verse, uh, especially Raghab al-Asfahani in his book, uh, Gharib Mufradat al-Qur'an, where he looked at some of the strange uh, words in the Qur'an, he found that this word fasad means actually خروج الشيء عن الاعتدال قليلا أو كثيرا It is when something goes away from balance, when it becomes unbalanced, a little bit or a lot, then this is a corruption. It is fasad. And so it is a corruption of the mizan, of the i'tidal, the balance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set up in the universe. There is a balance uh, outside in the planetary world. There is a balance in the vegetation, on the earth, in animal life, in human life, all types of life. There is a certain balance. And whenever we go outside of that balance, then it becomes corruption. The opposite of this balance is salah. That is something that is uh, uh, sound or something repaired, something online, which is balanced. This is the opposite of the corruption. And it is interesting that the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, some of the great Sahaba, when they looked at this verse, they discussed this verse, and Qatada and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Abbas, and many people commented, on this verse and they said, what could Allah have meant by corruption on the earth? Al-fasad fil barq. And one of the meanings, very interesting, is that this would be a decrease in animal life and vegetation on the earth. Because of the sins of human beings, the children of Adam and Eve. Because of this, a decrease in animal life, vegetation. Also, uh, there would be a decrease in the ocean, in the seas. And we see it coming to pass now, literally. That on earth, we are literally losing different species. In the oceans, we find that fish are being destroyed. Pollution has spread around the world. Our rivers are polluted. Lakes are polluted. Parts of the ocean being polluted, especially along the coastlines. And the verse continues. Corruption has appeared on the land and the sea because of what people have done. We will make them taste something of what they have earned, that they would return to the past. So we taste it now. We taste acid rain. We taste pollution in the water. In the UK, they have this mad cow disease, right? Viruses in their cows. So they taste the corruption. Why do they taste it? لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ In order that they would return to the path. And so it is sunnatullah that is coming to pass. It is something happening in front of us. And we have to be aware of what is happening. And recently, the president of the Maldives Islands, uh, which is off uh, the coast of India in the Indian Ocean, Sheikh Abdul Qayyum, he addressed uh, a gathering of the nations. And he said, the Maldives is one of the smaller states. We are not in a position to change the course of events in the world. But what you do or do not do will greatly influence the fate of my people. It can also change the course of history. What was he talking about? Now, only in recent months, it is coming clearer and clearer. The Greenland ice shelf, which a frozen, which was a frozen, uh, huge formation of ice in the northern part of the world, is melting down. And if this continues to melt, the ocean could be rising by meters. And this would be catastrophic. It would be catastrophic for the island states. And it is possible, la samahallah, may Allah forbid, 
that island states like the Maldives or the, or the Comoros or the Seychelles could be literally underwater. It also means that cities on coastlines with reclaimed land could also find their reclaimed land underwater. And I'm not just talking about here, but that's obvious. I'm talking even about Cape Town, where I'm living now, that a whole section of the waterfront area with the highest real estate is on reclaimed land. And if the ocean rises, all of this would be underwater and, and the coastline would be at a famous place called the Table Mountain. This would become the coastline. And so it is coming to pass. And unfortunately, recent uh, calculations have found that from 1750, from 1750, we have released more carbon dioxide and methane at any, than any time in the past 650,000 years. This is how crazy it is. And so it has reached the point where human beings will have to come together. And I believe seriously that within the next 10 to 20 years, that the present world that we know, and the borders that we know, and the countries that we know, is going to change. And we will be forced to come together as a human race. We will be forced to reanalyze how we organize our countries, how we organize our families, what is the intention, how we deal with technology. We will have to analyze this to look at where we stand. And it is crucial for uh, people of uh, conscious consciousness and for Muslims to come together to try to deal with this reality that we are facing on the earth. The United Nations has recently released interesting information. And this is another point to consider as I go into the final part of this topic. And that is that we are living in the largest generation of young people that has ever existed in human history. It's the largest generation of young people. And they estimate, and, and usually the United Nations has not done us well, actually. But when it comes to international information, gathering information, they have an excellent system of gathering this information to help us understand what is happening globally. Their uh, estimate is 48% of the world population is under 24 years old. 48% of people on earth. In Africa, 60% of the population of Africa are under 25 years old. 60% of the people. And this is very serious, especially when we look at the activities within our communities. For the Muslims especially, how many programs do we have for young people within our communities? Do we have recreation? Do we have a way for a young person to grow up and then come and find themselves uh, in a state of Islam as an adult? And so because of this, it's very interesting. They have focused on certain points as the major crisis issues. These are major crisis issues for the world. And you see it played out in different societies. Not all of them everywhere. But you will see these points. Number one, one of the greatest crises of the younger generation of people on this earth is violence. It is violence. State violence, occupation of countries, and also criminal violence that takes place within the societies where people are struggling over uh, materials, <clears throat> fighting over things in their cities. Secondly, the erosion of traditional values. The erosion of traditional values. And you'll see in most of societies, people living in China, people living in the Arab world, living in India, living in, in, in all parts of the world, in Africa. You say to the younger generation, and they're becoming the majority, you take your food 
and then you say, what would you like for dinner? And they tell you, I want to go to McDonald's. I want to go to McDonald's. Kentucky Fried Chicken. I like pizza. This is Italian food. Everybody's eating Italian food all over the world. Why is it? And just as we were coming now, I saw an interesting sign. It said McDonald's has date pies with a crescent. It's made from dates, especially for Muslims fasting, right? So you can break your fast with McDonald's and be Sunnah. You see? This is the McDonaldization of culture. That's literally what it is. What does it do? It erodes traditional values. The systems that we have developed in our countries, that young people respect their parents, right? The culture, especially the Muslims who have Sunnah, which is something that affects the way we eat, the way we dress, the way we relate to each other. It gets eroded and it gets confused and another type of global culture takes over that causes confusion in the minds of the younger generation and then turns people into consumers who only care about making money and buying things and then adding and putting their material things up and then judging another person, not by their taqwa, not by their piety or their character, but judging them by the materials. They have the shoes that they are wearing, the cell phone. What kind of cell phone are you talking on? What kind of car are you driving? Judging people by this. So it erodes traditional values. The third point brought up by the United Nations is that one of the great crises facing the, young, the, the younger generation today is poverty. And this part of the world has been blessed with wealth. But in the southern part of Africa, and in Asia, and many parts of the world, you will find uh, uh, malnutrition, and you will find thousands of people living in shack-like conditions, in conditions you would never believe could actually be set up for human life. But this is the reality that is happening in the world, and the overwhelming majority of the people today are actually starving and have malnutrition. The next point brought up by the United Nations, and it's interesting to compare as we look at our own understanding, is disease. That disease would become one of the great crises in the world today. And we see this in Southern Africa maybe more than anybody else, because HIV AIDS has reached the point where there are some places in Southern Africa where 36% of the population are HIV positive. 36% of the people. The most active thing going on in many of the communities is janaza, it's funerals. This is the biggest event that is happening in many of the township areas in Southern Africa now. It's funerals of people who are literally dying from the HIV AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and other diseases that are spreading through the land. The fifth point of the major crises that are facing the world today is drugs. It is the abuse of substances like alcohol and other drugs. And don't think that alcohol is not a drug because alcohol is drugs in liquid form. That's all it is. And it destroys the body, it destroys the mind. And you will see in the world today, as we go, a culture, a global culture that is being pushed upon our societies where people who feel bad about themselves or depressed, they, instead of turning to their creator, they take a drink. They turn to alcohol for company. They turn to drugs in order to escape the world. And what happens? Dependency where the person becomes dependent on the drugs and then loses their values, loses their morals, loses their, their consciousness, and they are capable of doing almost anything. We in Southern Africa, in South Africa in particular, we are living in the epicenter of the drug crisis. Every known drug in the world has to pass through our country. In between Colombia and Asia, when the drugs are coming through, all the different forms of heroin, uh, uh, of, of cocaine, of LSD, of all the different types of drugs are passing through our country and having an impact on the society that we are living in. And so in looking at this, we have to understand 
that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, last of the long line of prophets, he did not speak from himself, but he spoke from above seven heavens. And this revelation, this way of life, is the last of the revealed major religions of monotheism. The last one to come to humanity, to help take us to a different plane of understanding, to take our responsibilities on earth, and to help us in all ways of life. And it is reported that the Prophet, peace be upon him, that he, uh, in his last major sermon, called the Mount Arafat sermon, that he said to his followers, take this message, which is focusing on the oneness of God, on the fact that we should not be exploiting each other, the fact that there is no preference of Arabs over non-Arabs, or white over black, or vice versa, the fact that women should be protected and respected. It focused on this and bringing society together in goodness. And he said to his followers, those who are present should take this to those who are absent. Over 120,000 people. And they traveled to the four corners of the earth. And this message affected society in all types of way. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Al Hikmah Dalat al Mu'min. Ainama wajadaha wa huwa ahakku biha. He said, Hikmah, wisdom, knowledge is the lost property of a believer. Anywhere he finds it, he is most deserving of this. And so the Muslims took the knowledge of the ancient ones, the knowledge of the ancient uh, uh, Chinese, Indian, Middle East, Africa the Greeks, the Romans, they took the wisdom of the ancient ones and put it together with a Quranic understanding, the last message, put it together in a, in a new modern form that could be used by society to the day of resurrection. And so during this period of time, and especially if we focus on the seventh century, uh, between that and the 15th, 16th century, this is the golden age of Islam. And this is called by many historians as the dark ages of Europe. And no doubt the lights went off. When the Roman Empire fell, knowledge was being held by monks in monasteries. But what is not recorded is that during that time, Muslims of all colors, of all nationalities came together in Muslim Spain, Al-Andalus, in North Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia. And they developed most of the modern sciences, the systems of science that we know in the world today. And so zero, sifa, this is an Arabic word, zero. One, two, three, four, five, you're counting in Arabic numbers. Algebra, trigonometry, calculus, these are all developed by the Muslims during this period of time. The basic scientific method, alchemia, which is the basis of alchemy, from which comes chemistry. History, the systems of recording history in an objective way. And you can continue on and find that in most of the disciplines in the present university system, that Muslims during this period of time were able to take this knowledge from around the world and put it in a new form based upon the revelation that had come to them. And so this society impacted the world. But remember the understanding of the waves of human culture. It is in the Renaissance period, which is not actually a Renaissance of Europe, it was the Islamic Renaissance that was translated because the places in Europe where knowledge sprang up were actually translation centers. And they translated the documents from the golden age of Islam and were able to set the systems for the modern, system, for the modern world. But remember, this last wave of human life that goes out, it colonizes the earth, it decimates the aboriginal populations, it exploits, it burns the forests, it controls the populations and then it enslaves millions of people 
takes them out of their homes and sends them around the world. It causes mass migrations. And so what happens is the world goes into a series of crises. And Muslims have to remember who they are. We forget sometimes who we are. We forget that we are actually carrying with us the last message of the Prophet والسلام, the last message that came from the Creator of the heavens and the earth. And so you find in the world today, there is a spiritual crisis. And people around the world are now turning to magicians, fortune tellers, all over the world. Even in the industrialized countries, they turn to magicians. They are turning to people to tell uh, uh, their, their fortunes. And even in America, there's a person named Edwards, John Edwards, and he will stand you there on a stage, and then they say he has the power to talk to your dead ancestors. So as you stand there, he talks to your grandfather, and he says, yes, this is your grandfather has come. He died about 20 years ago, and I'm talking to him now, right? He's dead, right? But he contacts the spirit world. And so he says, I'm talking to your grandfather. He has a yellow sweater on, and uh, he died from cancer. He died from cancer. That's a good guess, because maybe half the population died of cancer, uh, you know, in that 20 years ago anyway, right? So he makes a good guess, and if you nod your head like, yes, he continues. And this is watched on television by millions of people. Millions of people. And you find in many countries now the magicians are coming forward. What is known in the Quran as the Sahara. The Sahara from the time of Fir'aun. They are coming forward with these types of sha'wada, of this magic, voodoo, obia, shango, which is coming forward. In, in Southern Africa, we have a terrible form of magic. May Allah protect us from us. They do what is called muti. And muti, if they want power, in order to protect themselves for evil, or give you some benefit, they take a human being and they cut off one of his limbs. And the more he screams, is the better it's gonna be. And they take that and they mix it up in the drink. Right, they make a strange potion, and then they make you drink it, in order to get power from demonic forces. This is one of the most cruel forms of this magic, but it is a reality in the world. Muslims have what we would call in North America the Declaration of Independence. And that is Al-Fatiha. That is the opening chapter of the Quran, and especially in the spiritual crisis, Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nista'in. This is the Declaration of Independence. Why? Because when we say that, Iyaka na'budu, you alone, O Allah, we worship. And from you alone do we seek help. You then change your relationship with every other creature on earth when we focus directly on the creator of the heavens and the earth. And so we forget sometimes what we are carrying with us, a message of straight spirituality. The world also is going through economic crisis because we are living in a time where people are printing paper notes and the notes are supposed to equal the gold and silver in the bank. Those notes that you have, dirham, dinar, dollar, pound, euro, it's a promissory note. And it was developed in parts of Europe from Venice, where if you traveled and you wanted to uh, you know, buy something a thousand miles away, instead of carrying the gold with you, if your businessman knew somebody in the place, he gives you a promissory note. They said, this note, I will pay back 500 pounds of gold. And that's on the note, right? So this is a promise to pay it back. So when the bank gave you this, it's a promise that the bank has got the gold to back up the note that you have. The problem is today that people print more notes than they have gold and silver in the bank. And so it becomes, it overflows. Right? And then interest and usury comes in, and a, a, an implosion happens, where it explodes within itself. And we see it coming about in uh, America today, because many people wanted U.S. dollars. Some people still want U.S. dollars, but the dollar's going down. What is happening? 
America owes seven trillion dollars to the bank. Seven trillion dollars in debt. But we all want US dollars. What is happening? Why do you want this dollar when there's seven trillion in, in, in debt? Why? It's a trick. It's an illusion. A deception. Put in front of your eyes. It doesn't equal the gold and silver. And so now it is coming back and it's exploding from the inside in what is called a recession. And it is coming to pass. We have the cure. In the Islamic system, we have an interest-free economy where people would not exploit each other economically. They would buy and sell with goods, with, with, with gold and with uh, uh, different types of things that have value in itself. It has value in itself. We would buy and sell with this and not exploit e each other for borrowing money from the bank. This interest-free system, if it is developed on earth, would change the relationship of human beings with each other. It would change profoundly if it happened. And so within our system, there is hope for the future. The world also today is in, a spirit, is in a social crisis. A social crisis in terms of the family. Family systems are breaking down. In many countries, marriage is an endangered institution. You know like endangered species? It's about to disappear. In some countries like Canada, more people have what they call common law marriages than the regular marriage. You see somebody, you like her, she likes you, so you live, you live together, let's go. You don't have to get married. You don't need to take any vows. You live together for five years, and then you say, I'll see you later. And if you have children, they have to fend for themselves. This is causing confusion in societies, and exploding also on the inside. Also, people are confused about their own sexuality confused who they are. And in some countries, the man, he's John during the day, and he's Jane at night. He changes. And sometimes you don't know who he is. It's just based on what kind of clothes he has on. So he's unsure of himself. And when he has that unsurety, they will say, no, you are a woman trapped in a man's body. Come out of yourself. Be yourself. You're really a woman, right? But you just happen to have too much testosterone, so your beard is growing. But come out of yourself. This is causing confusion in the, in the societies. And it is causing the marriage institution to break down, which is the building block of the society. So the whole society is then in a state of confusion. And so Muslims have the last hope for humanity. The last hope is with the Muslim family. And I heard this, I traveled far north into the Scandinavian countries. And far in the north in the countries called Norway and Denmark and Sweden, especially in Norway, the Norwegian people who are fishing people, country people, right, who have tradition of family. And they respect the family, tight families. This globalization that hits their society has caused such a confusion, the identity of the men being confused. When Muslim men came, and I heard it from the lips of the women, nine out of 10 people accepting Islam in Scandinavia are women. And we said, how is this? When Islam has got a bad reputation for women, right? They propagandize Muslims, they, say they beat their wives. They oppress their women. And many Muslims do oppress. But Islam does not oppress. So when the Norwegian woman saw what Islam really was, and saw Muslim men practicing Islam, they entered Islam. And they said, you Muslim men, if you practice Islam, you are the last hope for the family. After this, there is no more hope. And so it has come to pass that Islam, that we are blessed with a system of life that needs to be practiced. It needs somebody to implement this. We need to look into ourselves to make the changes inside of ourselves. 
and to be able to take the responsibility on earth. As we are told in the Quran, in the beginning of creation of humanity, Allah tells us, in fil ardi khalifa, I am creating, I will create in the earth a khalifa, a representative. And people look at this term only in a political sense, as the head of state, but no, the essence of the khilafat is the responsibility on earth to represent the creator of the heavens and the earth. So if the environment is in trouble, if society is in trouble, then it is the duty of humanity, and especially those who are carrying the last message, it is our duty to go forward and to spread this message and to hold hands with people of other religions, other nationalities, people of consciousness. Make alliances, come together before it is too late. In the next 10 to 20 years, and Allah knows best, the present earth that we know, the borderlines, the countries, it is about to change radically and never go back again. And those who want to really know what is happening, read in the words of the Prophet Muhammad and what the Muhaddithin call Alamat al Sa'a, the signs of the last days. Read in this, then you will see more what is happening on the face of the planet Earth. And so I pray that Almighty Allah Azza wa Jal would help us, uh, Muslims who are practicing Islam, to come together with people of consciousness, of other faiths, other nationalities, to dialogue with each other, to be able to deal with the real responsibilities on earth. Taking our role as the Khalifa, calling to the good and forbidding evil, al-amru bil maruf wa nahi an al-munkar, and dealing with our responsibility. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he did not speak from himself. And some people say, oh well, this, uh, this talk about environment, this is green peace, the greener people. You know what the Prophet, peace be upon him, said? He said, if the day of judgment is coming, Qamat al Qiyamah, judgment is coming, and one of you has a seedling in his hand, he should plant that seedling. Plant it. The day of judgment is here. But you have a plant in your hand, plant the seed. Take care of the earth. Even in the most extreme circumstances, take care of your role as the Khalifa on this earth. I leave you with these, these words. I ask Allah to have mercy on me and you to accept the prayers of the believers in the month of Ramadan, to accept our fasting, our good deeds, and that this month would be a source of uh, uh, peace and comfort to those who are in occupied zones, those who are suffering. May Allah have mercy upon them and this ummah. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Yeah, um, I was serving in Toronto uh, as the Imam of a big mosque called the Jami Mosque. That time in Toronto there was only two mosques in the city. Now it's a huge community, maybe the largest in all of North America. At that time there was two mosques. And I was expecting actually uh, a lot of questions about aqidah, about faith and fiqh. But most of the problems coming were social problems. And from there I went behind the veil into the Muslim families. And I found that there was a lot of oppression. Where men were exploiting women where people are calling divorce, talaq, 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 talaq. They say talaq like water coming out of their mouth. Not understanding the seriousness of divorce within Islam. Also physical abuse. Um, you know, the, the, the children and parents estranged, children running away from homes. And it's usually coming about because the lack of taqwa and also a misunderstanding about what Islam really is. Because in many cases we follow our culture and we don't follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, but we follow our culture, what people do around us. Okay? And so, this was about, we opened up a social service center, and about 70% of our cases were social problems, family problems. And this was manifested, part of the reason, not all of the reason, but, but in, in, in many cases, it was men abusing their authority, 
and abusing um, their, their physical strength uh, in dealing uh, with their family. Now, any other uh, general questions uh, coming up? Floor is open for any questions uh, that anybody has. In the back. Uh, you spoke about uh, the hate, uh, climate change and about the previous conditions. Now, how is it related to disobedience of the law? And how is it uh, related to the use of the law? And the uh, second thing is the matter of the local law. Like, uh, if you have one of the industries, uh, you can have different technologies. Okay, um, in verse 41 from Surah Al Rum, chapter of Rome, right? That's the verse that I read where it's saying, Dahar al Fasad fil Barri wal Baha bima kasaban aydin nas. So it said, Corruption has appeared on the land and the sea because of what people's hands have done. Right? And literally, it is not technology, it is the use of technology. That's what the problem is. In other words, a person can exploit, uh, can, can, can use technology, but if they think, if, if it is environmentally friendly, in other words, they are not destroying uh, the environment instead of fighting the stream and controlling it, they, they let the stream uh, 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 move and they build aqueducts and use the power of the mountain, right? Or the power of gravity and the water flows nicely. Or you can fight against the mountain, right? Or you can develop the type of uh, uh, chemicals that literally destroys living things. So it is not the fact that we have technology, but in the industrial age, there was more emphasis placed on materialism than there was on uh, 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 balance, keeping our relationship with the natural world. You will find, especially in what is known as aboriginal culture, the original people, you'll find a respect for uh, you, uh, living things. In America, we have people called the native people uh, that Columbus called Indians, right? But he was lost. He thought he was in India, and he bumped into America, right? He wasn't an Indian. But the point is, that amongst the natives, um, whenever they would build buildings, uh, make a city, they would plan five generations. How is this, this structure, how is this community affecting five generations? That's how they think. Right? Whenever they uh, uh, slaughter an animal, right, they're making a prayer. Right? Whenever they did anything, they thought about the relationship of that act to the living things around them. What happened in the past 500 years is a lack of respect for the living things. It is just consumerism, materials, build, develop, structure, with no regard for the things around us. And so we are reaping this. We are literally tasting the effect from uh, uh, this uh, reckless use of technology and knowledge. What I'm talking about now is a holistic approach to science where the scientist is actually believes in God. Many of the scientists in the past 500 years, they become atheists. They say God is dead, man. There's no God. So I just do what I want to do. Some of them have a God complex. They think they're God. Okay? But the scientist who is honest should actually see, when he looks at the, the, the complexity in nature, when he looks at the system set up, he knows there has to be a divine being in back of this. There has to be. And with that in mind, he would structure uh, his technology and his systems in order to en enhance life, to beautify the earth, and to protect other living things. And that is part of the Islamic system in the golden age of Islam that Muslims were developing. And when we lost it, right, out of arrogance, tribalism, and, and, and greed, when we lost our authority, 
we became part of this global uh, globalization swallowed up by a, a secular materialistic uh, society. Right? So we need to return now, and people are all over the world are trying to look for now holistic systems now in the way they live, trying to restructure how they function. And we are blessed to have the Qur'an in its original form and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam authenticated that we can put this into practice, into effect in the way that we live in society and in the world today. Now, other questions? Floor is open for any questions. In the front here? Or? A question. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, she wants to know uh, regarding racism amongst uh, the Muslims. Right. Uh, how to deal with it in regards to you know, racism from you know, Arabs and Muslims from Asian origin? Right. Okay, well, racism, um, one group thinking they're better because of the color of their skin or because of their language or their body structure. This is something which has been with human beings from early times. Actually, you go back to the creation of Adam with Iblis, with the shaitan. Because when Allah created Adam, He said, uh, uh, you know, to, you know to, to, He said, bow down to the angels. Iblis was a jinni, and he was there, right, with the angels. He refused. Allah said, why? He said, you created me from fire, and you created him from clay. So he's a racist. Okay, it's beginning right there. And then other people, everybody has this. You look into yourself and you say, I like somebody, I think that's the most beautiful thing in the world. My color, my nose structure, my, the, my, the texture of my hair, I think that's better. In the time of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, there's a number of cases, it happened amongst his companions. And there's a famous case of, 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 of Sayyidina Abu Dhar, radiallahu anh, who called Sayyidina Bilal, radiallahu anh, he said to Bilal, you're the son of a black woman called him a racial name. And when this came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his face got red. And he said in words to, to Abu Dha, you have jahiliyyah in you. You're an ignorant person. And Abu Dha, who was uh, a pious person, but he had, like everybody has, he had this nationalism. He went to Bilal and put his head on the ground and said to Bilal, step on my head. Step on it. Okay, Bilal forgave him. But the point is, it existed even back uh, in those times. So today, we need to begin to respect each other's culture. To respect each other's culture. Okay? But one of the things of racism, you see there's three levels. One, there is verbal, uh, no, there's ideological racism, where you actually think that you're better because of history. And you write history according to yourself. Right? Two, there's verbal is an action part of racism. You call somebody a name, right? But the third one is what is called institutionalized racism. That is where people of certain colors or nationalities, they get certain jobs, and other people, they get lower jobs. Okay? The worst form of this may be the caste system of India, where people are actually untouchables and different castes. You're born into a caste, and you stay like that for the rest of your life. That may be the most extreme form. Uh, of this, you know, levels based upon uh, race and caste, you know, in, in uh, Sanskrit, Hindi is actually is referred to its color, something to do with your race and your color. Okay, so uh, we first have to look into ourselves, right, and try to understand why does a person think that they're better. Some people think that they're better because of their families, right, their language. But if you think you're better because of your family, then look at the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Lahab. He was Hashimi. He was of the noble family of the Prophet ﷺ, but according to the Qur'an, he's burning in hell. Even though he was Sharif. So family is not enough. We respect the family of the Prophet ﷺ, but your lineage is not really enough. Okay? And the scholars say, if you think you're better, then look at your creation, look at yourself. In a short time, we, we, we get older, we get weak, and eventually we die. And when you die and they put you in the ground, nobody wants to go down in that hole with you. I don't care how rich and famous you are, right? How much property you own, nobody's going down there with you. We come from a humble place, and we shall return, inshallah, to a humble place. And so we need to go to the roots of racism and see ideologically 
right? Deconstruct history. History has to be rewritten according to everybody's story, right? And not just the story of the conqueror, but everybody's story. The ideological racism that has to be dealt with. Racial names being given. And in society, institutionalized racism has to be dealt with where every group, according to their abilities, would have upward mobility and not be stopped because they're a certain nationality. This is how it has to be played out. <clears throat> but Muslims today, we have a very serious uh, road in front of us because tribalism, qawmiya, uh, it exists. As the Prophet ﷺ said, it is a filthy thing. And it does exist amongst us. And we can never expect to get the help of Allah if we are discriminating one against another. That's one of the reasons why uh, after the Golden Age, Muslims actually went down. It's because of this. So now, what is happening is that more and more people are coming together and starting to appreciate each other, not based on color, but based upon the action of the person, the piety of the person. This is what the Quran actually teaches. So granite, all the other islands are made of volcanic rock or of corals. But this is, a this is granite formation. And they claim they are the only island chain like that in the world. Okay, and when the, when the um, Gondwana, when, when the massive uh, continent broke up that made the present day South America, you know, Middle East, Asia, Africa, you know, uh, Australia, when that broke up, they were in the middle. And they didn't go to either side. They got stuck in the middle. Right, so it's literally like a mountain under the water sticking up, and the top of it is uh, the, uh, the set of these islands, you know, these granite formations. So it's like um, what they would call in the West, like Jurassic Park. It's like when you're walking there, it's like you're in the age of the dinosaurs or something. Because of the formations in there and the vegetation and the granite, it's really strange, man. And some of the rocks look like alien rocks or something, something from a, a meteor or something. So this is what is really strange about it, you know, uh, the islands there. And they usually talk about Seychelles, they say the rich and the famous and all that. But actually, the majority of the people in the Seychelles are, are poor people. It's a Creole population. And um, they have drug problems, and just like in other problems like anywhere else in the world. And Islam is spreading there now. The Islamic Information Center uh, has opened a public exhibition. And uh, there's a big uh, anti-drug program going on. And Muslims are taking a leading role uh, there in the Seychelles. So it's very interesting. Uh, possibility for the future uh, in that region, but it's a granite for formation. Now, the brother here in the front has got a question. Assalamualaikum. Uh, Waalaikum uh, I would like to ask something. As Muslims, we are sure that Allah is the Creator and He controls everything. And also, we know in experience in life that about the uh, healing powers of Quran. Now, I do not understand that the people of other religions, he may be a Hindu, he may be a Christian or anybody, that people are so convinced about their healing powers and they flock in thousands to them. Like, I do not understand how they, I mean, how it happens, like how they get healed or how their faith is so much, either uh, is it psychological or coincidence or does a shaitan have any role to play in it? Okay, I'm not exactly sure which group you're talking about, but uh, science and medicine, um, healing uh, using natural um, uh, herbs and different things like that, this is something which is shared by all, all nations. It's not only for Muslims. So within um, Hinduism, within Christianity, native religions, you will find people who develop systems of, of healing using natural products and other things which are very effective. So they are able to use these, and they have charisma, and they are able to attract people uh, uh, to these groups. But um, in terms of the, the spiritual things, this is the weakness of human beings. That human beings, they will follow a, a charismatic leader, you know, and uh, they get caught up in um, you know, the sounds and, and the sights and the group feeling which is developed. Right? It's a type of group um, uh, uh, you know, propaganda. Even the Nazis, the Goebbels, who was the Nazis' propaganda expert. You know, Hitler was a, was, a, was a tremendous speaker, and they could brainwash you using propaganda. This is what is being used today, uh, you know, in BBC and CNN, right, and all these programs, right? The man standing in front of you, he sounds so correct, 
He's lying 100%. But he's so professional about it. You believe him, man. You might be standing right in the place, right, and the opposite is happening, but he says it so effectively, you look around and say, uh, is he right or wrong? Right? This is magic, like the Sahara, like the magicians in the time of Fir'aun. They had the ability to create illusions, right? So they would throw their sticks and they turn it look like snakes. But what Musa salam had, when he threw his asa, he threw the staff and it ate up all their snakes. So when the truth really comes, it will uh, uh, consume all of the false uh, uh, ideologies you know, that exist all around. But it needs people who are sincere and who are serious about putting it into practice and putting it into their lives. Now, for the brother. Such mammoth issues at hand, uh, reaching to the level of the United Nations. Uh, what common masters and individuals can do uh, to uh, help themselves? Okay, this is a very, very good question in terms of what we can actually do. And I believe honestly that we can do something as individuals. That if people start to change their own lives, that it can actually eventually work up. It doesn't have to be from top down, it can come from the bottom up. And we, the, 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 the common people, the lowly people, who have no political power, who do not have millions of dollars or, or other currencies, right? we can do something. Even just by reusing things, recycling things, right? Start not just throwing cans around and poisoning our bodies and poisoning the environment, right? Start to try to live a more uh, natural way, right? Have, have a smaller carbon imprint on the earth, right? Try in the best, following sunnah, right? And staying away from chemical things, right? And, and destroying the environment. And when it starts to, to, to work, it starts to move, you know, it eventually grows and it expands. Also, we can pressure uh, our leaders, you know, to, to, to be more involved in um, this struggle to protect the environment. Because it is for the good of the leaders and our community, because our societies are going to be destroyed. But pressure needs to be applied. Articles can be written into the papers. Pressure is applied to the leader. Look at the situation, right? So, so we don't have such a terrible carbon imprint and, and destroy the environment uh, so much around us. So we can start, and, and, and we, whatever we do, at least on the day of judgment, we, will, we, we can face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, I tried to do something. I did something on my own. Even if I didn't have the power, but I, I tried to do something. So every individual needs to learn what it is to reuse things, recycle things, uh, uh, you know, to, to start looking at more natural type of products to avoid chemicals in their food, in their lifestyle, and it will actually help us in our own lives, the more that we are able to live in this natural way. And it's really closer to the sunnah. If you really look at the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu how he ate and how he lived, you will see that it's very environmentally friendly, actually the way they used to live in, in a sunnah way. And, and we can still be modern and follow the sunnah. We don't have to go back all the way 1400 years, but we can take the principles of the sunnah and then apply them to the world we are living in today. Wallahu alam. Okay, I can't comment on what is happening in the Middle East because I don't live in the Middle East. Um, I'm living in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and it's very confusing what is happening here. You can't believe the papers, right? Um, but I, what I have found in traveling is that there is a rise in consciousness all over the world, all over the Muslim world. There are more and more people returning to the masjids, go, going back to the sunnah, there are people accepting Islam. Many aboriginal people around the world are actually accepting Islam now. Even in the United States, when you think that Islam is, is under attack, it's still the fastest growing religion. Right? A lot of people accepting Islam. So this is the reality of the world we're living today. You know, no, they will not be able to put out the light of Allah. Right? It's like a fool trying to blow out the sun. He thinks the sun is too hot, so he gathers all his friends around and they blow at the sun. Right? They'll never put it out. Right? And that is the reality. But we have to look at ourselves. Are we practicing Islam? Are we part of the uh, problem or part of the solution, as some people would say? Right? Where do we stand? 
That's what we have to look at now and, and deal with what is in ourselves uh, first. Now. No, I appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. I had a question about this. Uh, you were talking about Sahar. Like, uh, as a Muslim, you're not supposed to believe in um, what the fortune teller tells. Or, right. Uh, you told most of the things he says are a guess. So, I myself, I had an encounter with a uh, fortune teller. Like, my friend was showing him his hand, and I was like, it's nothing, it's rubbish. So, he actually, he told me many things about myself. So, I think one can be guessed, two can be guessed, three can be guessed. But everything cannot be guessed. So, what is all this stuff? Yeah. Okay, well, you know, um, there's different opinions in terms of magic. Some people take a position magic does not exist, right? It's all superstition and whatever. Other people believe in magic as though it is revelation, right? But our position is, is that magic does exist. It is a reality, right? And within our sources, the, the kahana, the wizards, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and many of these people, they contact the jinn. And the jinn are made from smokeless fire. And they live in a parallel world. And so these jinn would steal into the atmosphere and then get messages as they're coming down. They'd actually get certain informations. Okay? So that this kahana, this kahin, would actually, um, he tells you, you know, 100 things. Um, most of them are wrong, but a few of them are right. He got something right. And we as human beings, we forget what he said that's wrong, and we only remember what is right. Okay? This, that's how they work. And they watch you, right? As soon as you come in the door, they read you. Ah, he's a worker. Look how he walks. Look at his shoes. Look how he holds his hand. And they'll read you, and they'll start saying things about you as soon as you come inside, right? And so they'll guess certain things about you. And they can even look at you when they say something, and you start nodding, uh, 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 like that. Then they go more. If you start to go like this, then they go the other way. Right? So they know how to read you, right? And that's what you've got to realize. A lot of it is a trickery. But there are some of them who actually have contact with the jinn. And they will know certain things about you because of their contact with the jinn. And it is the evil jinn, by the way. And it's dangerous. That's why we have to seek refuge in this. Right? And stay away from it. And seek refuge from it. Because it does have some power. And if it hits a believer, then um, it's for a test. It's for purification or a test, right? But, you know, the best way is, is just not to be involved. If you live a, a halal life, right, you're fasting, eating halal food, making your prayers, you're okay, man. A person called me up in Toronto and they said, you know, um, uh, he said my wife, uh, every, uh, every, sometimes a big black object comes at the bottom of the bed. Right, she sees it. I don't see it. But she sees it. Okay? And what, what should we do, Brother Abdullah? So I said, okay, we're in Canada. I said, Brother, um, do you eat halal food? And he said, well, we're in Canada, you know, and we're far away, and sometimes I try to eat halal. I said, okay. I said, do you make salat regular? He said, well, you know, it's cold in Canada, and I can't always make my salat, but I try, you know, sometimes, right? I said, oh, okay. Right? So, then he said, uh, you know, and she's on the other line. Then she said, I'm seeing it now, it's coming. Right? And they said, do something, Abdul. I said, what am I supposed to do? Am I the Pope? Like, what am I supposed to do? If you are practicing Islam, if you eat halal, and you're making your salat, and you have tahara, you have purity, these things, most cases, are going to leave you alone. If you're not making salat, you're eating haram foods, right? And you're, and you're living this lifestyle, then you open yourself up for evil forces uh, to touch you. So the way to really deal with this is to practice Islam. That's the basis of the thing. Then if you have a problem, there are certain people, you know, uh, a few amount of the ulama, some of them uh, have this understanding of how to deal with this jinn. I don't myself. Only a few people have this ability. Right? So, so the best way is to, you know, focus on Al Malaika, focus on the angels, man. Okay, Malaika are here, man. Right? It's Ramadan, the jinns are locked up, man. So forget about them. Okay, focus on Malaika. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what Ramadan does for us. Okay? But we focus on the jinns too much. 
They said the jinn is here and they walk backwards with their feet backwards and they do this and they say, Brother Abdullah, he comes to me and he said, I got a headache. The jinn is in my head, man. It's a jinn. Get him out. I said, Brother, how many jobs do you have? He said, I have two jobs. I said, you, so you're working like uh, 16 hours a day. He said, yeah, I looked at him. He has, I said, brother, there's a word called, word called stress, right? It's stress. You need to get rid of one of your jobs, right? It's no gin in your head, right? You're working too much. Okay, so, but we, so we tend to use these things as excuses, right? And we need to focus on the creator of the heavens and the earth and the angels instead of focusing on these superstitions and other things like this. Okay, so we want to end uh, here uh, now, and uh, thank you for your attendance uh, here tonight. And um, for those visitors here, there's information in the back, and you can always get at the Qanat al Qasbah uh, information. And um, uh, we want to uh, say to the Muslims, you know, may Allah accept your prayers and your fasting uh, in Ramadan and all the good deeds that you are doing. May Allah have mercy on us <coughs> and unite us. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa